I want to invite you to turn with me. We're going to be uh, really in a couple different places this evening, uh, but we're primarily going to be looking at uh, 1 Corinthians, a few verses here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As you're turning there, I want to kind of reorient us back into where we have been in this uh, summer series on the home. Last time we were together, we looked at the, the home and the church and looking at the relationship between what is the relationship between the home and the church? That there is not a, well, one is a substitute for the other, one is a replacement for the other, but instead they work in partnership for what the Lord has called each to do with each of their own functions. And one of the things that we're going to see, Lord willing, this evening is that's the same that he has for another set of offices, if you will, or another set of roles. While you're turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I want to make reference to a verse that many of you should be familiar with. He created them male and female. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1.27. There, God states that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. These distinctions, maleness and, and femaleness, are real. They're by design. And as God himself declares at the summary of the day in which he created them, as he's looking at all of the works of his hands, all that he had done was very good. I remember the the first time I taught on biblical masculinity and femininity at at the school, at, at CCA, one of the things that was just beginning to pick up a little bit of steam in terms of mainstream cultural uh, exposure was some of the, the, the transgender insanity. It, it was this picking up it's sort of a public acceptance to some degree, and especially the teenage level, the, the middle school, high school level, there was a greater level of, yeah, yeah, that should be treated as normal. Not within necessarily the student body, but all of their peers, all of the media that they're exposed to. It was a gentle conditioning that was beginning to start to say, I mean, really, is there such a thing as maleness and femaleness? Aren't these things all just cultural constructs? Aren't these things all just, you know, stuff that's been picked up through the ages, especially if it's coming from an evolutionary mindset? There is the idea of that, you know, this is just stuff that we accumulated at particular points of our evolutionary development, but we don't need those anymore. Or it's a social evolution that's a carryover from days when there was these necessities, but we don't have those anymore. We have microwaves today, so we don't need all of these, you know, toxic masculinity. And we don't need all of this other kind of femininity. And all of these things had sort of a cultural moment of confluence where all of them are coming together in this perfect storm right in the the mid-2010s where all of that is beginning to kind of explode. And I remember standing in front of a classroom of probably 20 or fewer uh, high school students and talking about, all right, let's talk about the fact that there is such a thing as righteous masculinity. And how for a huge demographic of our society, a huge age demographic of our society, those terms really don't have any content I, I, I thought as I was preparing for this evening, there's, there's going to be across this sanctuary, there's going to be those who, when they hear the term masculinity, have a whole lot to kind of fill in that, that category with. But then there's going to be a whole other swath within this room tonight who are going to hear righteous masculinity and be like, ah, I, I know it's a thing. But exactly how I would label that, what that looks like, it, I know that it's there, but it's a little nebulous. I could probably tell you a lot of things that it's not. I could probably tell you the caricatures of what effeminacy in our culture looks like. Not femininity, but effeminacy, this, this sort of embracing of feminine qualities that we would say, well, those are sort of anti-masculine. But would we be able to, in particular, 
going to the abiding standard of God's word say, this is masculinity, this is femininity. Because there is such a thing. And let's also be clear about the fact that there has been so much unnecessary, we're going to talk about the necessary side of this in a minute, but there has been a lot of unnecessary cultural baggage associated with both masculinity and femininity that sometimes we feel insecure with, well, I mean, what exactly is that? How much of that is just cultural trapping that got shoved in there at some point, And how much of it is legitimate? How much of it is, again, the caricatured version versus what really should be in there? But before we get into a lot of the distinctions and the, the, the very specifics of, okay, well, this is what God says about these things. <clears throat> I really believe that we have to lay a foundation. And even if you would say, I'm, I'm part of that group in here this evening who would say, no, 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 I, I've got a really solid category of biblical masculinity and biblical femininity. Even if that's the case, what I want to do is I want to make sure that we lay the foundation for the need to have those categories well-defined. Because even if you might possess them, the world and the society in which we live, they do not possess a well-defined category for those things. They do not possess a well-defined category for what is righteous masculinity? What is righteous femininity? There's such even a attitude and a stigma around the idea of, well, masculine or feminine. As something that's not a pejorative, that's not a, well, we're talking badly about that thing. It's not a derogatory term. To call something masculine and, me, masculine and mean it as a compliment is something somewhat foreign to the world and society in which we live. To have a, well, they, were, they, were, they were very feminine and mean that as a compliment for a woman is actually something a, a little bit, I mean, are we allowed to say that? Is, is that something that would be a acceptable category to have these days? But when we come back to Scripture, one of the things that comes so plainly to the light is that Adam and Eve, our first parents, man and woman. In fact, Eve doesn't even get her name until the end of chapter 3. The man and the woman. They have distinct design. They have distinct roles. They have distinct functions. And they have distinct glory in their creation. One of the things that is, again, a necessity of our age is to say maleness, femaleness, masculinity, femininity... Those are by design and they're good. They're good. You know, there's a lot of things that we would think, like, ah, that kind of goes without saying, right? But this, in our age, is not one of them. You who are parents in this room, especially with young children coming up, this is something that you will need to instruct regarding. The masculinity... In men, femininity in women, those are good. They'll have to be actively instructed in their lives because the world in which we live does not have that as a common viewpoint. That is not something that we have as a just cultural norm of, well, yeah, that's how things are. We cannot assume that that's just something that people think. We also cannot be silent about it. We cannot just say, well, I'm, people, that's, a, that's a touchy subject. We're just not going to talk about it. We're just going to kind of do our thing. And when this other side is promoted, I'm just, I'm just not going to say anything about it. And I'm not saying we need to be abrasive necessarily. I'm not saying that we need to at every point sort of have on our, you know, scope something to say, oh, oh this person, they disagree with me. I'm going to go hit them with the truth. That's not what I'm saying, but we do need to have a readiness to say, no, no, I, I know this well from God's word and biblical categories. 
what is manhood and womanhood? These distinctions are under attack. And our world hates that there is any kind of distinction along these lines. We've moved in the last 60 years in particular <clears throat> from rampant feminism to say man, that there is such a thing as masculinity is bad and needs to be, if not equalized, subordinated to feminism. And feminism, not femininity, but feminism as an ideology to now we're in an age of promoting and promulgating, spreading the idea of, no, androgyny is best. The idea that there shouldn't be any distinction. There shouldn't be any discernible difference between men and women in the way that they behave, the roles that they function in, in any sort of capacity. There should just be this absolute level field in everything. And scripture doesn't hold to that. One of the things that I think we can, we can very easily do, and again, we're going we're to touch on this a little bit more in a moment. One of the things that we can very easily do <clears throat> is get on the cultural bandwagon about something. And, and sort of have a diluted biblical view of it. We can look at this and we'd be like, yeah, look at all the craziness that's happening in our country, in our society, in the world at large. Those things are bad. Well, Why? <clears throat> well, because it's destructive to our society and our traditional values, our conservative values. Okay, but, but why? What's, what's underneath it? What's really at stake? Whenever you encounter somebody or if you ever drift into this place where you're attaching, hey, this is a good value but you don't have it anchored in, this is a biblical reality. It's like trying to play Monopoly with all of the pieces and none of the rules. It will not make sense. It will not make sense. You'll have everything that you need in order to have what you should do, but no real guiding principle as to why. And then what happens? It becomes a free-for-all. In our society, it's <clears throat> almost impolite or, or regarded as this archaic attitude to talk about gender roles and distinctions. What kind of Neanderthal believes in those things anymore? But all of that is really the outgrowth of neglect. And it's the outgrowth of rebellion. It's the outgrowth of things like the sexual revolution the lost generation, and the abandonment of biblical foundations. What's remarkable is when you start going back and saying, okay, what went wrong? Which is, which is a helpful exercise. It's limited in how helpful it is. You, you know, there, there is a limit to, well, if we could just figure out what went wrong. Well, we don't have the DeLorean. We can't go back and fix it. So what, what can we do? Well, we can diagnose and make sure we don't do the same things. When you start looking back, <clears throat> at history and start saying, all right, when did these things really begin to unravel in, in mass? Some of the places you start to see this is in the Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment. So we're talking like late 1700s, early 1800s, where there is an abandonment of biblical mooring and, and adherence to the trustworthiness, the reliability, uh, belief in the inspiration of Scripture, the authority, the authority of Scripture. And once that was shoved off from, they burned the rules to monopoly and said, but look, we've got all this paper. Let's, let's make a game. There was this, we're going to remove ourselves from the authority of what do we do with all of this and try to make our way on our own. Fast forward through all of the conflict that flows into the 1800s and eventually leads us into the period of like World War I and what was known as historically that generation before the quote greatest generation, that World War II, Depression era, that's known as the lost generation. Why? Well, because millions, millions of homes and families lost their parents, lost the leadership in their home. 
And they were lost in more ways than one because even if there were those in the home still to lead, because there had been such a devastating event, it was, well, let's move away from, we can't trust the Bible, any connection we did loosely have to it. Let's just go ahead and abandon that. We'll keep some cultural trappings of morality and religiosity, but as you drift into the 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and you get into the next generation that really led to the sexual revolution, what you have is now all of a sudden of people going, we're just sort of pursuing hedonism, self, um, self-exaltation, enjoyment. We're just pursuing pleasure. This is kind of the, the boom of the American dream in terms of prosperity. And when that turned up empty, it was, let's get rid of all of those things and just pursue pleasure in any form we can find it. What that led to then has been now the last, again, 40, 60 years of, well, who's to rule over us? Everybody's just going to do what's right in their own eyes. You think you're that? Go ahead and identify as that. You feel that that's best for you and that'll satisfy you? Who am I to judge you? And if we start tracing this back, where did it all begin? Drifting from the authority of God's word. A removal and a rejection of, okay, what, what has God designed us to do and to be? All of this has brought us to the age that we live in of outright confusion. So when we talk about the home, and this is where we are in our series. When we talk about the home, we say there is masculinity and there is femininity. We have to understand this is not a home in the sense of idyllic, at peace. This is a home in a war zone. We're talking about the home under attack. At it, its most elemental features. There are men and there are women. And God has designed them distinctly. Are we going to be able to hold that up? Are, are we going to be able to attach to a biblical, or a biblical foundation in this? And again... This is where I want to get into this idea. This isn't cultural trappings. If we think, or if our ideas of masculinity and femininity femininity are epitomized in John Wayne and June Cleaver, it's not that. It's not from a particular time period, unless we're talking about what we've already mentioned, the pre-fall. There's not a, you know, if we could just get back to... If we could only reclaim. Now, were there cultural trappings that were beneficial? Would we rather live in a society in which there is the normalcy of, yeah, there's, there's men and women and that's good. Or what we have now of, be what you want to be. No, we would obviously say one is better than the other. However, apart from a biblical foundation, neither will last long. Neither will last long. Both are self-destructive. They implode because they can't bear the weight of the things that they're dealing with. I said in particular, it's not culturally defined exclusively. There are cultural norms. This has been one of the great mistakes of the, the last generation at least to say, well, no, no, these things, you know, yeah, masculinity and femininity, they're just culturally defined. Well, as soon as we surrender that ground, we start saying, well, then why is it wrong to wear this, say this, appear this way? There is cultural effect. Those things are real. There are things that a cultural culture cumulatively recognizes as, no, 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 this is masculine and this is feminine. And one of the things that you'll see in the sort of modern debate arena of this is, well, I mean, there was a time, you go and look at the paintings of, you know, uh, the Victorian era, and the men all had heels and lace on. So, really, what's, but, but listen, A, no one is advocating to go back to that. B, B, let's be clear, there was still a clear distinction between that and what the women were wearing. Even in a situation where there is a cultural distinction, where we would say, and and this is the other sort of extreme you'll often hear. Oh, but in the Bible, everybody was wearing dresses. No, they weren't. 
they were wearing robes. And even in the days of robes and togas, there was a distinction. There was an ability for the Lord within his word in Deuteronomy to say, no, the men don't dress like women. And the women are not to wear that that, like the King James said, pertaineth to a man. There's a clear distinction there. Even in those times where we would say, because of our cultural inability to discern some of those things, because it's not our culture, we would recognize and say, I don't see that big of a difference. And yet, there is. It's not all culturally defined. But there are still cultural norms. Those things are good and to be embraced and promoted. And again, I'm talking about this because we need to know just how far we've come from the original design. We need to know just how far we've come from the original design to recognize, okay, do I have in my well-defined biblical categories, if I possess those, do I have them as biblical categories or are they only culturally informed? Are they only traditionally informed? Are they only informed by what's normal to me or... Are they bound in by, this is what God's word says. When we say, no, there is a distinction, according to God's eternal and unchangeable word, there is a distinction between how women dress and how men dress. And that distinction is to be upheld. Are we saying that just because, I don't like that, I can't imagine trying to, you know, somebody dressing this way and appearing this way. Or are we saying, no, 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 it's because God said so. Because God in his word said, there's not to be that. Even elsewhere, places we're not even going to look this evening, but across God's word, it'll say things like, those who are effeminate. Very unique thing that Paul is discussing there in 1 Corinthians when he says this. But he says, those who are in that way of men who are not behaving as men, one of the things that's said in 1 Corinthians about that is they will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is some of the seriousness of this. And where there's so much cultural confusion, believers, Christians, have the only clarity that can be brought. Where there's cultural confusion, Christians are the only ones who can bring clarity. Why? Because we're the only ones that have the truth. Again, in the series, we're dealing with this in connection to the home for a couple of reasons. One of them I've already alluded to. Number one, future men and women are being brought up in the home. Future men and future women are being brought up in the home. One of the first times I encountered that idea, my wife and I were very blessed when we first got married before we were ever in a place where we're like, man, we're so excited about having children. Well, we're still like looking forward to that and saying, but that's down the road. Very early on in our marriage, we had someone exhort us and instruct us according to the idea of you should raise your children with the future in mind. What's cute today is not cute 10 years from now. The behaviors that you think are, well, that's not a big deal now, when they're big, no, no, that, that's a bigger deal. So you parent with the future in mind. But, but I had never really connected this dot until about the year before my son was born. And I was reading a book, the title of which was actually Future Men. And it was the idea of the little boy that you have, the little girl that you have, is a future man or future woman. And you have to raise them with that in mind. That idea of what are they idealizing now? What are you indoctrinating them in now of, hey, this is valuable. Because one day they will be a man or a woman and they will say, and these are the values that I was equipped with. This is what my pockets were filled with of truth. Future men and women are being brought up in the home. And secondly, husbands and wives are men and women. Which again, there's some things that you just wish you didn't have to say. But here's the reality of our cultural moment. Accordingly, Men and women should do the jobs of husbands and wives in manly or womanly ways, respectively. And if we don't know how to do that, 
Singularly, we're going to talk more about that, which by the way, that is a word. It didn't autocorrect. Then we certainly won't know how to do it together. When we consider the uniqueness of oneness and the, and the help meet nature of the marriage relationship, we should have an idea that if we don't know what role we're supposed to play, it will only cause confusion and distortion. And I use that imagery on purpose. Our, our children's <clears throat> curriculum for the summer, looking at um, <clears throat> God's perfect design. This is what our kids are, are learning on Wednesday nights. One of the things that was prepared for that says this. Marriage was designed by God like a play. The husband and wife each have a part in this play as a character in God's work of redemption. In this play, the husband would play the role of the Lord Jesus. The wife would portray the role of the church. Together, through their lives, they would show just how the Lord Jesus Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, and how she loves and submits to the Lord Jesus Christ. In order to show this work rightly, men and women must know their parts. We have the script, the way the play is supposed to function in God's word. When we obey it and live according to it, we're able to show God's wonderful work of salvation and sanctification. When we do this, he receives glory. If we don't know the part that we're supposed to play, it's just chaos and confusion. If we're trying to improv what God has already clearly articulated the direction for, we're going to mess things up. Thirdly, if you're in a season of singleness, whether that's because through death maybe you're no longer married or because you haven't been married yet, you still must function as a whole man or woman. These things are, are not without their drawback, drawbacks, these seasons. When we lie about life and say, hey, one, there's no difference between being a single man and a married man in terms of the way that you're going to behave or the, the value of them. Listen, <laughs> one is not necessarily better than the other. If it's the Lord's design for you to be in a season of singleness, and by the way, if you are, it is, then do it well and right because it's from the Lord. But there are differences between those seasons. And to level them out and say, well, they're all the same, it is to harm both. So whatever season you're in as a, as a child at home, a single person, or as a spouse, you must be that in the role as you have been made. Now, before we get into, okay, the definition of this, this is a long, long runway. We have to look at something else. But we have to consider something that is sneaked in in significant, significant ways to just the way that we think about stuff. And it's the error of Gnostic Manichaeism. And I'm going to explain what that is in a second. But it's the error of believing that our forms, our bodies, are evil or even just insignificant in themselves. We need to make sure that we think clearly about this because even if we can, we can think, well, no, 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 our bodies right now aren't, but later it just doesn't matter. No, 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 no. You're already in 1 Corinthians 11. Turn with me just a few pages over. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You probably know 1 Corinthians 15 is, our, is, is a entire chapter devoted to the significance of the bodily resurrection of Christ and his people. Which means that Paul is drawing a hard line to say it's not enough to think your resurrection is going to be something wispy and ethereal. But look with me at 1 Corinthians 15 and look with me at verse 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? And look at how Paul's going to respond to that sentiment of mockery. Verse 36. You fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished. To each of the seeds a body of its own. He goes on and distinguishes the different types of bodies that God has established. But look at this at verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Verse 42. 
It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthly, earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we also will bear the image of the heavenly. If we've bought into this idea that somehow our eternal state will be less substantial than the one that we are in currently, we completely miss the point of a lot of what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 15. One of the things he's actually going to go on and, 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 and pull apart and pull open for us a little bit more in depth in that chapter is to say, the grain that gets put in is of a lesser glory than the fruit that emerges. In other words, the body that we possess and that we are currently is nothing to be compared in glory with the body that we shall receive at the resurrection. That means that what we have to look forward to is greater than what we currently possess. Beyond that, we have within even God's own design of himself and his self-revelation. We have the reality of God reveals himself as Father, Son, and Spirit, whom he is referred to as He. But we're not going to be some just eternal, unidentified, sort of disembodied spirits. That's not what awaits believers in eternity. What we shall be is yet to be revealed, but it's better. It's infinitely better than what we currently are. And who we are now doesn't get obliterated in eternity. And who we are now is intrinsically tied in our maleness and femaleness to our own personhood. It's easy and it's sort of sneaked its way into our own understanding, this sort of like, Eastern mysticism that we're spirits trapped in a flesh suit looking to escape. And sometimes we can even lean towards like a Romans 8, we're longing for something else. But Scripture continually points to, but we're longing not to be unclothed, but to be clothed further upon. We're, we're looking for the better. By the way, that mentality, that idea that like, our bodies are just sort of disposable meat suits we really shouldn't be excited about, that we shouldn't really be attached to them at all because, hey, we're going to leave it, yes, and depart, yes, but to be clothed further upon. We, we must have that further part. To, to accept the other side is to buy into this idea of the gender, transgender ideology that said God every now and then has a mist pour into the meat suit. He gets the female ones into the male ones and they're all just confused and maybe we can get things straightened out with our modern surgical procedures. So we have to have this. This is, this is why I start with the goodness of maleness and femaleness. The goodness of how God created us. Now look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to begin in verse 7. Now, the section that this is in, Paul is giving directions for how the body ought to conduct itself while it's gathered. And there's a lot that's going on here we're not going to get into. There's stuff in here we're just not going to touch tonight. We don't have time. And, and I have no intention of looking at. But, verse 7 in particular Paul gives the reason for why, as men and women gather, there are distinctions in their roles as they gather. Verse 7, For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. Now, let's just sort of leave this first part here and, and say, this is talking about exactly what we are. The distinctions in roles between men and women. That there is a distinguishing mark, which by the way, the text goes on and talks about it's her hair, okay? So, we're moving on. 
the first thing here is there's a distinction. Which again, in our moment of cultural chaos, it's kind of all up for grabs. Why can't a woman be a pastor, a preacher, a fill in the blank? Because God's word said there's distinctions. Because God's word, not just in one verse, but across the pages of scripture says there's distinctions in function. That's where we're going to leave the first part of this verse. But what I want to key in on here is this idea of since or because he is the image and glory of God. To begin with, as we look at biblical masculinity, man as the image and glory of God. John MacArthur says on this text, the male was given the dominion and authority over God's created world and is by that fact the glory of God. I'm not going to take the time. We're running out of it very quickly tonight. It's just moving fast. I don't know what happened. But, all the way back in Genesis, and we should be familiar with Genesis. We should be familiar with those foundational portions of Scripture that teach us so much. We saw even just in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul makes reference to, as it was written, this is how God created Adam. As we get further into the book of Romans, in the months and years to come, we're going to come across where Paul makes reference to, and this is what happened with Adam. And if we're going, I'm a little fuzzy on that, we're going to have a hard time with it. We should be familiar with these foundational texts. But Genesis 1 and 2, God commissions Adam and makes him a sub-region, a vice-region, a steward of his creation. He's going to rule over his creation, but not ultimately. He is going to rule over it under the authority invested with God's authority over it. That's what's taking place, and we've talked about this in the past, that's what's taking place in the, in the task of naming the animals. That was a form of exercising authority. And God is telling Adam when he's saying, hey, name all the creatures. He's saying you're going to have the authority over them. So as a foundational understanding of biblical masculinity, we need to recognize man as the image and glory of God. I want us to consider this with three headings, three categories. We're going to work through them very quickly. First of all, made as a leader. Man is made as a leader. Secondly, man is made as a servant. Man is made as a servant. And and by the way, biblically defined, these two are not antithetical. These two are absolutely so intertwined and harmonious. And finally, man is made as a worker. And all of these have the responsibility under the headship of Christ. All of these have have the idea of responsibility under the headship of Christ. The first one, made as a leader. One of the things that God does in particular in establishing man as, in this function, this role as a leader, he's called men to be the leaders in the home in the church, in the jobs that God has given them. He's called them to be the leaders, to be exercising authority, but also to bear the weight of that authority. This is not a tyrannical rule. This is not a, well, I'm the boss, I'm in charge, therefore you must. Instead, this is the responsibility of carry the weight of leading the way. The book that the men received is the, uh, the, the men's conference book uh, in the Christian home. One of the ways that this talks about this is that the man has the responsibility of setting the pace, setting the priorities. And I forget the third one because it's not my notes. But in, in establishing what does it look like within the home? That's the role of the husband in his leadership role in the home within the church There's a biblical category, a biblical qualification of male leadership. This is not uh, excluding in the sense of, well, women just aren't up to snuff. That's not the idea at all in Scripture. Instead, what we see, instead what we see is, no, 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 this is a task, a burden, a labor that men have been outfitted for And in respect and honor of the ladies, of the women, of the, as scripture defines it, weaker vessel, they're not going to be saddled with that responsibility as the normal function within the home of leadership. 
And within the church, there's not really a category for it, and we're going to have the women leading in this. Instead, there is a function of women having a role, and we're going to see this in just a minute within biblical femininity, made as a helper, made as a servant, and made as a keeper. But for the men, there is this leadership that's issued to men that's in particular perfectly portrayed and modeled by the Lord Jesus himself. The sort of leadership that men are to portray is the leadership that Christ portrayed himself. Which is one of the reasons that we have to move directly from leadership into service. Because Christ's leadership was a leadership in the service of others. Being a leader in the kingdom of God means taking on the responsibility of serving first and most. That's why we say in particular that this leadership is not tyrannical in its function. And, by the way, it's also not merely a, well, I'm just going gonna, gonna to do and hope people follow. There's also the directing and guiding in this is how we're going to go. This is how we're going to accomplish these things. This takes us into this idea of men being a servant. Because this is always done for the benefit of another. Think of how Christ defined his own ministry. Mark 10.45 is one of the key texts on this. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, right? And to give his life as a ransom for many. One of the reasons that's so significant, one of the reasons that's so important is that we need to understand that our leadership and our service is specifically a service that's geared towards the benefit of others. Think about how Christ even defined his own relationship with his father, the one who had authority over him. I don't do these things that please myself, but only those things that are pleasing to the father. This takes us into that third category, the man's role as a worker. When God first made Adam in the garden, he gave him a job to do. He gave him a job to do. That job in particular was good. Remember, at the end of all that God does in, 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 in creating man and, 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 and woman in the garden is, he says, it's, it's very good. The task that we've been given to cultivate and to keep, to grow and to protect, to provide for, this is a good labor. That means the responsibilities that God has given to men are to be rejoiced in. It's a humble, glad assumption of God-given responsibility to borrow from one pastor. Next, and again, we're flying through this. Biblical femininity. Back in 1 Corinthians eleven seven, 7. The man is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. MacArthur, again on this text, says... Man is both the image and the glory of God, while woman is only the image of God and not the image of man. And the glory of man, not the glory of God. The point is that man shows how magnificent a creature can create from, God can create from himself, while woman shows how magnificent a creature God can make from a man. Uh, another theologian, Charles Hodge, says this, the only sense in which the man, in distinction from the woman, is the image of God, is that he represents the authority of God. She is not designed to reflect the glory of God as a ruler. She is the glory of the man. She receives and reveals what there is of majesty in him. Which, by the way, lest we start thinking, why, well, I, I don't like that. Uh, understand, that's another responsibility. That's another layer of that burden of, and whatever glory there is, that the woman will have, it's going to be derived from whatever glory the man has. That's a burden and a responsibility. He goes on to say it this way. This was so helpful in understanding this. She always assumes his station. She becomes a queen if he is a king and manifests to others the wealth and honor which may belong to her husband. This is that idea of starting here that biblical femininity is made as a helper. Lest we think that this is somehow like a derogatory, just little helper kind of idea, 
one of the things that's so wonderful about this is that God is described with his exact same language many places in Scripture. The role of the helper is one who beautifies and gives completion to the work. Women make the task given by God better through their godly service. This is not some diminished thing. Instead, it is all of the enhancement. I think this is another really helpful understanding that we have to connect with this. When God saw that something was not good in his creation, he made woman as the answer. It takes us into this idea of the woman's role as a servant. Women have a special job of bringing a sweet completion to the task they engage in. Godly women in Scripture are portrayed as a support and blessing to those who they are partnered with. In particular, think about that in connection to like Proverbs 31. That her husband's heart trusts in her. Why? Well, because of all the things that precede that description. For godly women, this role of helper will require submission to godly authority. As the man is submitted to the authority of God, so the woman is to be submitted to God and those who have protective authority over her. She's free from the burden of leadership and free to live in the blessed protection of the men in her life. Now, different seasons, that's going to look different. But one of the things, again, our, our, our society twists at different points. Whether that's to say, by the way, and this is a massive qualifier, this is not saying women are to be in submission to men. This, that's not what that just said. That's not what the text said. And this is, again, also not talking about value. This is talking about function. But understand, this does mean that as God has designed it normally and ideally, that there is to be a protection of authority where that burden is not placed upon the women, but is placed upon a man. This leads us to this idea of Women is a keeper. Because the wonderful job given by God in the garden, we, we get this pattern. Men and women both are to be cultivating and keeping the thing entrusted to their care. I think one of the clearest distinctions or one of the clearest ways that we see this sort of illuminated is in Titus chapter 2. Women both old and young are taught in God's word to be workers at home or keepers at home. Cultivating and keeping means to make something better and protect it. The, the word that's actually used there in that description is the idea of being a ruler of the household. The actually word that's used in Greek is where we get the word despot. The, the, the woman's domain is given to her and she is to have the responsibility of authority over it under the authority of her husband. One of the things that that means is that women have been gloriously given the task of making better and protecting their home. And again, these are good. One of the things that we ought to recognize is whenever we hear things like this and we have any kind of a revulsion to them, any kind of like knee-jerk rejection of them and go like, ah, I don't know about that or that doesn't sit right with me. One of the things that we ought to do is say, okay, according to what in God's word do I not like that? Or is this because I was just brought up differently? Or because I've always been informed of things this way. I was taught never to hear that, abide by that, take that, think that way about myself, think that way about my role, think that way about my daughters, think that way about the women in my life. I was never, or the men, the same thing. If there's a, I just don't like that. I, I, th I don't, that doesn't sit well with me. I'm uncomfortable with that kind of thing. What we have to do is we have to take a step back and say, by this standard, I reject what I just heard. Not, well, I'm just, I, I don't like that. If we find something in here that runs contrary to these descriptors, then we don't do them. But if instead something rises up in us and we're just like, yeah, that's uncomfortable. I've never thought that way, been taught to think that way. Everything else in the society pushes me in a totally different direction from that. But I see it in God's word. That's the point where we lay down our objections and say, I see it, I just want to do it. Now we're going to look at this, and we did look at this previously, and we looked at the church and the home. We're going to look at this more as we move forward in this series through the rest of the, uh, the next several weeks. But one of the things that 
inevitably comes up at this point is, okay, but what does this look like in the day-to-day practicality? And that's where I would say the church finds one of its most significant functions. This is where the church and the home are so significant in the formula of, okay, well then how do I do that? If I want to be a biblical man, if I want to be a godly man, and I want to fulfill the roles that have been given to me, how do I do that? Well, one of the first arenas in which this is to be instructed and modeled is the home. And, disclaimer, every home will do it imperfectly. Every home will do it imperfectly. And, as we looked at within the relationship with the church and the home, the, church, the home is not the only component in this formula. There's also the instruction primarily and the modeling within the church. That there would be instruction from other godly men of this is how this looks. That's the pattern set for, out for us in Titus chapter 2. So there's no space for, I, I, I never had anybody teach me this growing up. Welcome to the church. I never had anybody show me how to do this. Welcome to the church. And within the church, if you say, I've never seen anybody do this in the church, look at the text. And then let's do it together. And through the one another's, we'll be ironing out, okay, how should should we do this? How how should this go about? If we look and say, there needs to be a pattern and instruction for how does this look for me to function as a godly man or a godly woman? I have to be portraying this in my home first before I can legitimately be doing it within the church. This is so critical. It's not an either or. It's a both and. For biblical men and biblical women, both are submitted and laboring in the arena where their labor is to be displayed. The home is the arena in which biblical masculinity and biblical femininity are first tried and tested. But we need to understand the home is not just the four walls and the roof. In thinking about this, one of the things that I had to, I had to run to in my mind as, as I was wrestling with this idea is the reality of especially men like Abraham and women like Sarah. We don't get to say, like, look, what we have now is not adequate for me to fulfill my role. And they're, they're living in tents as strangers and pilgrims, looking for a better country. And yet, they were laboring to fulfill the, the design that God had placed in each of their lives to the degree that they are both used as examples later in Scripture to say, be this way. Follow after that pattern. The arena where our masculinity or femininity is displayed is the arena of cultivation that you've been placed in and charged to keep. That's why I say if if it's a season of singleness, labor to be a godly woman in that arena, in that season, in the fullness of whatever that looks like at this season of your life. If it's a season of marriage, labor to be a godly woman. And by the way, we tend to try to bifurcate, try to separate and, 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 and distinguish somehow of, well, there's me being a godly wife versus a godly woman. I understand, if, if there's not a, I'm a godly woman, there's not going to be a, I'm a godly wife. This is why so often you'll hear this in the language of discipleship around here. You've you, you got to be doing well first with the Lord before you're doing well with the others with whom you interact, whether that's roommates, whether that's with other family, whether that's with your spouse, whether that's with your kids. In whatever season the Lord has you in, labor to examine and and see, am I functioning well in the role that God has given me that's mine? Am I keeping and cultivating this place, this arena that I've been placed in? Am I fulfilling the task that's been assigned to me by who God made me? This is where we have to circle all the way back to goodness. 
whatever you have been made by the Lord is good. It's easy for us to say that in the face of some of the, again, cultural chaos of things like transgenderism. But let's go all the way back to what now with all of these categories loaded. If God made you a man, if God made you a woman, that means that he has this design for you. That's the way that we're supposed to function. And if we don't like that design, we have to fall back by faith on this design is good. How he made me is good. By the way, none of us does any of this instinctively well, which is why we need that instruction of the home and the church. That's why we need this instruction from God's word. This is why we need the examination to say, am I filling these roles according to God's design or have I settled for something else? of this comes naturally. Because while Adam and Eve, our first father and mother, were created good, they did not remain so. And in their sin, they took all of us with them. And now, as scripture continually says, we've corrupted our own way. Which means that even if we feel like, now I feel like really settled in my own uh, ideas of what these look like, we need to be careful and examine them according to Scripture and labor to see how am I obeying by faith? How am I trusting the Lord in my obedience in the role that God has given me? And if we have to stop and say, you know, I'm not really having to use a lot of faith, we ought to see that as a massive alarm. If we have to look at the role that God has given us and say, I'm not really exercising a lot of faith in order to fulfill my role as a man or as a woman, then we really ought to consider, then are you leaning on your own flesh? Are you depending on your own strength to accomplish what God has given you to do? Because all of us are called to walk by faith, men and women. All of us are called to walk by faith in obedience. So as we come and we hear these things, and maybe it's just a season of strengthening, you would hear all of this this evening and say, yes and amen, and I knew that. And I trust with just about everybody in here, there's probably not a whole lot that's been said this evening that you would go, man, I just whew, had never heard that before. But instead, I do, especially if you would say, no, no, I'm all set here. I would want to exhort you and press you into and how are you obeying by faith? Resting in the Lord to strengthen you and enable you to accomplish all that he has given you to do. In your role, your good role as men and women. You pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your good design. Lord, we thank you that you have not left us to our own devices to try to discover or invent or conjure how we feel we ought to do these things. Especially in our condition in which our hearts are continually exchanging the truth for a lie. But Lord, as you have brought us to life by your Son, Lord, you have you've instructed us according to the way in which we ought to go. May we be those who walk in your way by your Spirit to the praise and glory of your Son. In his name we pray. Amen.